In the modern age of F1 rejecting fully funded teams with motorsport heritage, Kovkov and Dretti, it's almost unthinkable for a team to rock up mid-season and only start a single race with a single car, but F1 in the 1980s was an entirely different ballgame. Or not ballgame. In the early to mid-1980s, Scuderia Coloni had been racing in Formula 3 and Formula 3000, with a considerable amount of success actually, and at the end of 1987 they decided to enter Formula 1. Not for the next season, mind you, pretty much straight away, with a rookie driver, a hastily designed car, and a naturally aspirated Cosworth engine in a field dominated by turbo cars. Yeah, good luck. In qualifying for the 1987 Spanish Grand Prix, the Williams was once again the car to have as championship leader Nelson Piquet took pole position by a whole six tenths of a second ahead of Nigel Mansell, with the Ferraris of Gerhard Berger and Michele Alboreto third and fourth. Ayrton Senna was fifth ahead of the ever impressive qualifier Teo Fabi, and the McLarens of Prost and Johansson could only manage seventh and eleventh places. In the lower half of the grid, the top naturally aspirated runners were the Tyrrells of Philippe Streff and Jonathan Palmer, a whole 5.8 seconds slower than the top turbo cars. Yes, really. The most impressive performance though was arguably that of Nicola Larini, who managed to qualify for his and Coloni's first ever Grand Prix start by bumping both the sellers from the grid. Nicely done. When the race began, Mantel deployed a tactical smokescreen, wheel spinning his way off the grid behind his teammate Piquet. Behind them, Senna got past both of the Ferraris into the first corner, and Fabi got involved as well. Looking back into the field, I'm going to add one to the crunch count for this light contact I spotted between Warwick and Arnu, and you can tell by the way the field bunches up that Anu must have had a quick pirouette before rejoining the race. By the way, any more modern F1 fans who tuned in expecting to see the circuit to Catalina might be a bit confused right now, and you'd be correct in realising that this is not the same track, as Catalina wasn't to be built until 1991. This in fact is Jerez, which in my opinion is a far superior track. Mansell might agree with me, here he is taking the lead at the end of the first lap, up the inside into the hairpin. PK ducked and weaved all the way up the straight, but Nigel knew from his fight with Senna a year ago that all he had to do was hold his line. At this stage, Nigel was actually beginning to drop behind in the championship fight, and he was actually behind Senna in the standings, but clearly the bristling Brummy was not content with just scoring points. At the end of the first lap, the order was Mansell, PK, Senna, Berger and Alboreto. And then a random Porsche, apparently. What's that doing there? Now, as we watch the Williams cars yet again rocketing away from the opposition, it's worth noting that the two cars were not exactly identical. At this time, a radical new idea known as active suspension was slowly working its way into F1, where the suspension systems on the cars could be controlled by hydraulic pressure and computers rather than naturally stored energy. Williams were at the forefront of this innovation, and for this race the designer Patrick Head's smart head had decided on a head-to-head -head test between the active suspension version of the car and the normally suspended car. I'll give you three seconds to guess which one is which. Three, two, one... Nope! It's actually PK with the active suspension. Looks like it's not quite a step forward yet, but don't worry Williams, you'll get there. One team who definitely didn't get there is Coloni, whose first Grand Prix lasted only 8 laps. In all honesty, anyone who can build a Grand Prix car on a shoestring budget deserves to be applauded, and Nicola Larini did a great job to qualify that car, but it is a bit bizarre how they didn't attend any of the flyaway races after this. The next time a Coloni would be seen on the grid would be at the 1988 Brazilian Grand Prix with an entirely different Italian, Gabriele Tarquini. Larini, meanwhile, would go on to our cellar for 1988. If you can't outqualify him, sign him, I guess. Meanwhile, not much had changed in the train between 3rd and 8th place, but it seems the Benetton swapped at some point. That's now boots in ahead of Fabi. As for the Ferraris, they too weren't quite settled down yet, and Alboreto passed Berger as Fabi protested in the background. On lap 11, Pascal Fabre retired his AGS with clutch failure. The AGS that year was an example of a naturally aspirated car, much like the Tyrrell, Coloni, Lola and March, and there was actually a separate championship table just for them, known as the Colin Chapman Trophy. This was done to encourage teams to enter even if they couldn't afford big fancy turbochargers, and I think nowadays we should probably have a trophy specifically for cars not designed by Adrian Newey, for similar reasons. Anyway, back in the train for third, 
said they had to scrabble around the outside of Adrian Campos' Minardi, which actually allowed Bootsen to have a look at passing Berger at the end of the straight. Berger maintained the inside line, indignantly kicked up sparks and held the place, and somehow Bootsen still didn't get through on the exit despite finding the inside line. Good racing. Oh. There's a retirement, and as usual, it's Andrea de Cesaris. Also out of the race by this point was Pierre Carlo Ginzani's Ligier. Alio going extremely well in the Lola. Tends to have a habit of uh, departing the scenery somewhat re rapidly at some point during the race, and he's resisted it so far. Wow, Murray, you've been spending too much time around James Hunt, clearly. I'll tell you what though, he's not wrong. Now, despite the fact there were no mandatory pit stops, tyre strategy in this race was still a factor. After all, just because you don't have to stop doesn't mean you shouldn't. Partway through the race, Alain Prost stopped for new tyres from 8th place, and within a few laps he was right back with the cars he'd been racing before, just with fresher rubber. Seeing this, Williams decided to pit Nigel Mansell from the lead, and it proved to be well-timed as he came out just ahead of Piquet and still in the lead of the race. It was Mansell's race to lose now. By the way, watch this shoddy broadcasting from the 1980s directors. Ferrari Williams... Wait for it... Ferrari Williams. Yes, that was what viewers at the time actually saw, and right as both teams were fighting amongst themselves too. Here we are on the next lap with the Ferraris going side by side once again, and we cut away. Okay then. Oh, and if you were wondering, it's still Alboreto ahead of Berger, but look how close Prost is now. Oh, this is his opportunity, look. Berger goes up the inside of Alboreto for the third lap in a row, and Prost takes his chance and goes through into fourth place. Excellent move. His next target was Senna, just up the road. Meanwhile, at the front of the field, the stranglehold of the Williams team was at threat as Piquet pitted, and that's a very long stop, eight seconds longer than they took with Mansell. Piquet came out right in the battle behind, nearly blocking Berger entirely, and crucially coming out behind Prost, who had undercut him. The order was now Mansell first, then Senna, Prost, Piquet, and Berger. It wouldn't stay that way for long though, with his fresh tyres, Piquet went to the outside of Prost into Turn 1, and then got it all wrong and spun! That's no way to treat fresh tyres, Nelson! Just before this happened, Berger also came in for a pit stop, so Alboreto went through to 4th, Bootsen went through to 5th, and Piquet rejoined 6th. What an unnecessary mistake for the championship leader. By the way, I mentioned Bootsen just then, who we haven't seen in a while, but here he is, swarming all over the tail of Alboreto for 4th. Unfortunately, by this stage, Thierry was the only Benetton driver left, as the fast qualifying Teo Fabi had retired off screen with braking issues. But if he could score well at the end, then I'm sure the team wouldn't have felt too down about it at all. One lap later, he got his chance and went right up the inside of Alboreto for fourth, pulling it off in style. Now look at this train, Senna on old tyres holding up Prost, Bootsen and Piquet, and all of them doing their best to ignore the spinning Tyrrell of Philippe Streth up ahead of them. Here's an interesting situation look, they're lapping Senna's teammate Satoru Nakajima. Prost got through pretty quickly, but watch him holding up Bootsen and Piquet in the sweepers. Sneaky. This was all allowing Gerhard Berger to catch up to the pack too after his stop. Here's Piquet challenging Bootsen then, but look at Prost! He's dropped back to 5th and he's about to lose another place to Berger! And yes, that is Berger because Alboreto pitted off screen. What caused Prost to drop back I'm not sure, because unfortunately there were fewer cameras and replays back in those days to clarify things like this. But this meant that Bootsen was 3rd, followed by Piquet, Berger and Prost. Meanwhile Mansell's lead was up to a ridiculous 32 seconds, as you saw from that graphic. Talking of graphic, that is a stripped Formula 1 car, and that's Jonathan Palmer who had been leading the naturally aspirated cars. What actually happened is unclear, but it most likely involved René Arnoux, who retired at about the same time. This was gutting for Palmer, who had been doing a great job to run 9th overall, but at least he could now watch this great race from the sidelines. The top Colin Chapman trophy car was now Philippe Alliot's Lola, as he had, for once, not been the one flung at the scenery. I tell you what though, this is a fantastic race for second. I've not been able to show you everything that happened in this scrap, and honestly it's a shame that it doesn't translate particularly well in this video format. Anyone who's a fan of classic Grand Prix racing should absolutely get their hands on a recording of this race. This is great stuff! And look at this, here we go again! After all of Bootsen's attempt at passing Senna, he's actually going to be passed now by Piquet for third. This just shows how well Senna had been defending, because everyone behind him was swapping positions while he himself was sitting firm. 
And that's Berger now, blowing an engine! That was the unlucky Ferrari driver's 8th retirement of the season, and it definitely cost him a chance to fight for a podium in the latter stages. Also out of the race with mechanical failures were Alessandro Nanini and Christian Danner, because 1980s and reliability are not two things that typically go together. Oh, Piquet getting very racy behind Senna! Surely not even the great Ayrton Senna can hold back Nelson Piquet in an FW11B, surely not. Oh my goodness, well he will if PK loses it, that's so close! And here it is, PK goes through to second, and watch as Senna gets off his rhythm on the exit! Bootsen pounces and goes to third, Prost pounces and goes to fourth. The order is now a Williams 1-2 once again, with Mansell ahead of PK, then Bootsen, Prost and Senna. That's not how it would stay though. For the second time in the race, PK would have an off, under steering wide and going through the grass, and through went Bootsen. Scratch that, Bootsen got forced off his line and spun, retiring from the race. That's one way to get rid of your rivals of course, but now Prost was right up with PK for second. Also off screen, Ayrton Senna had continued to drop places, and fifth was now Stefan Johansson from 11th on the grid. Just Cinco Vueltas para terminar now. Sorry, five laps to go. Here's Prost then, in the same place that PK went off the lap before, going to the inside and getting through as PK locked a wheel. To be fair, PK's Williams seemed to be handling awfully in these late stages, but the McLarens were coming alive. And that's the opposite of alive, that's Alboreto blowing an engine from 4th place. Both Ferraris retired in the space of just 4 laps. Say it with me now. Duh, duh, duh. Another one bites the dust. Anyway, eventually the drama died down and Nigel Mansell came through to win by 22 seconds, moving up to second in the World Championship standings. Alain Prost was second in the race, and amazingly it was Stefan Johansson who came through in third, having passed Piquet off screen. Senna managed to hold on to fifth place, and Philippe Alliot came through a lap down in sixth to take maximum points in the naturally aspirated championship. Following him, Philippe Streff's naturally aspirated Tyrrell narrowly missed out on an overall top 6, and Eddie Cheever was classified 8th despite running out of fuel on the last lap. 16 cars were classified in total, which is actually not a bad tally at all for the 1987 season. Guys, before I give this race a score, I want to let you know that I have a Dailymotion account for all the videos that get taken down from my YouTube channel by the pesky FOM bots. Due to the high levels of parody, review and education my videos contain, I believe that all of them fall under fair use, but sadly this isn't always enough. On my daily mission, you can find the 1996 Monaco and Portuguese Grand Prix, as well as the 2008 Japanese Grand Prix, and more. I also now have a Twitch channel, where I stream about once a week and would really like to grow my audience. The links to both of these accounts are in the description of this video. Thank you. I gave the Grand Prix an 8.7 out of 10, because in all honesty, there was excitement and drama from start to finish. Okay, so Mansell's lead may never have been in doubt, but the battle for second was so damn good that I honestly don't care. The only thing that would have made this race better is if PK and Mansell had been slightly closer in the championship standings, thus adding some extra jeopardy into PK's excursions, but in terms of the actual racing, I have to admit that this is one of the best 1980s Grand Prix that I've seen. I'll give the Driver of the Day award for Best Driver to Philippe Alio for winning the naturally aspirated class and also scoring points overall from 17th on the grid. I'll give the Inoue Trophy for Worst Driver to Adrian Campos, who seemed way out of his depth in the Minardi. Drive safely guys, and I'll see you next time.